Poverty was not confined to the unemployed. It was estimated that a quarter of all households lived at or below subsistence level. The conditions so horrified many writers and filmmakers that they set out to record what they saw as the facts about life in 30s Britain. In one of these streets lives Molly, her mother, two brothers and baby sister. Five of them in two rooms. The whole structure of the house is really formed to pieces. Walls and ceiling are rotting with age. The air is full of soot from a hundred choked up chimneys. The floor is sinking so badly that wedges have to be put under the table legs to keep it level. In a modern farm, not even cattle would be stalled in such conditions. A million families in Britain lived in conditions like these. At night, the five of them, including a six-month-old baby, sleep in one tiny bedroom, hot and stuffy in summer, cold and drafty in winter, Molly's mother has long since given up trying to keep the vermin out of the bed at night. Most of these houses had no gas, electricity or running water. Uh, every drop of water we have to go out in the yard for to fetch in. If we want to wash the baby we have to use the dish and use it in the same room as where I am. And as for cooking, well, we have to use the gas stove alongside the bed where we sleep. And we drink in the other Much of what the filmmakers showed was backed up by books about poverty. Labour MP Fenner Brockway had his findings published by the Left Wing Book Club in 1932. I think the distinguishing feature of a slum is that the housing is so bad and the poverty so constant that the people have given up any attempt to make themselves or their homes look well. There are no clean curtains in the windows, the children are dirty, the women's hair unkempt, the men are unshaven. A woman, young in years, but wretched with anxiety and despair, invites us in. A family of seven live in two small rooms. I ask the woman what the family will eat today. Breakfast, bread and margarine. Dinner, bacon and bread. Supper, bread and jam, she replies. Sometimes we have tomatoes, but it's never enough. We get used to it but going without food makes you weak. Chronic ill-nourishment particularly affected the children, who frequently suffered from rickets, pneumonia and bronchitis. One of the loveliest and gayest race meetings of the year. Beautiful frocks, picture hats, the men in grey toppers. The toppers are not the only things that are grey. The sky is too, overcast with clouds, and then comes the rain. But the crowd and horses put up a brave show. Doreen Jane is an easy winner. The 46,000 ton liner is on her way to the shipbreaking yard and brings 18 months' work and £100,000 in wages to the hard-hit town.
get along We're in the money The skies are sunny Old man depression You are through You done us wrong We never see a headline About a bread line today And when we see the landlord We can look that guy right in the eye We're in the money Come on, my honey Let's spend it, send it, lend it Rolling along For many people, the 1930s were an unprecedented era of never had it so good. In places like the South and the Midlands, there were new factories and booming employment opportunities. Standards of living were rising for those in work because of falling prices. For some people then, this was a period of rising consumption and indeed the first age of affluence. But this side of the 1930s was easily overlooked afterwards when people only saw the powerful images of the hunger marches and the dole queues. This side of the 1930s, the side of booming affluence, was easily forgotten. For those with money, there was the chance of buying a semi-detached house for four or five hundred pounds in one of the new estates being laid out in the suburbs. This is the kind of thing we Londoners have saved and scraped for. A house in the suburbs, a home of our own, a place where the wife can be mistress in her own house, a place where the kids can run about in safety, a quiet, peaceful place where a man can rest and forget his worries for a while. The 30s saw the completion of over three million houses, mainly for private sale. Three bedrooms upstairs, one or two living rooms downstairs, a kitchen, a bathroom, and a lavatory. And each house has its own gut. Massive slum clearance schemes moved one and a half million people into new homes built by the local authorities. Architects of the modern movement introduced bold new ideas for housing. This house was designed by Oliver Hill as part of a new seaside estate at Frinton-on-Sea. New construction methods and materials made possible exciting new designs. Windows could now be made to curve round corners and run the entire length of a room. Because air and light were now thought to be essential to good health, the house is designed to be as open and spacious as possible. The 30s also saw the arrival of many labour-saving devices. In the morning, cause the water's hot, we can bath an army, the ascot does the lot. Happy after breakfast, cause the water's hot, dirty greasy dishes are left without a blot. Cleaning house has no more fears, the ascot's waiting there. Saving money, sighs and tears, an endless wear and tear. Happy in the evening, cause we know we've got water, water everywhere, and always boiling hot. The ultimate possession was a motor car, now available for as little as a hundred pounds. Surely the car that takes us everywhere in such comfort deserves the credit. And you may take my word for it, dear, we were very wise when we decided to depend on an Austin. Oh, 
People enjoyed increased leisure time, and with paid annual holidays, many working people were enjoying their first holiday away from home. The British ambassador in Berlin handed the German government a final note stating that unless we heard from them by 11 o'clock that they were prepared at once to withdraw their troops from Poland, a state of war would exist between us. I have to tell you now that no such undertaking has been received and that consequently this country is at war with Germany. The Second World War had begun and change was inevitable. The 30s had been a grim decade for the poor and unemployed. Their suffering helped spur the creation of the welfare state. For others, the 1930s had seen the dawn of affluence, which though interrupted by the austerities of the 1940s, was soon to reappear in the post-war world. It was a decade which influenced people's thinking one way or another until the 1980s.